and turn to the book of John, at John chapter 11, and we'll begin together in verse number 8. We'll look at this scripture together. We have come in our study through the Word of God as we've been on this survey of the Bible. We began in the book of Genesis all the way through the Old Testament. We discovered the 400 year period of silence. And we've come now into what is considered the gospel records. It is here that God is revealing to us the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one who's come to be with us. His name is Jesus, and he'll save his people from their sins. And God has revealed this to us. I'd want you, if you would, to look with me at this story. We find ourselves in the midst of a story in John chapter 11. I do not want to begin in verse number 1, but I want to begin in verse number 8. I believe there's a pause here that we need to see. It's important for us to know this pause and this interjection into this story to understand some things about God and about His Son, Jesus Christ. I do want to remind you that the book of John, as we've already done a book-by-book, verse-by-verse study of the book of John, it took us nearly two years to get through. John's writing here is trying to encourage us, and all of this was given to us, as found in John 20 and 31, where the Bible says, But these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Now, the reason God had the Apostle John pen the words of the book of John is so that you and I might put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone for our soul's salvation. If you don't know the Lord, this book will tell you how you can know Him. It will tell you of His Son, Jesus Christ, and how God the Father loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It will tell you that you must be born again. You must be born into the family of God. The book in its entirety is given to us to prove that Jesus is who He says He is. He is the Son of God. This is so vitally important for us to put our faith, our trust, our belief in Him. It's very important. I'd like for you, if you would... Join me in John 11, beginning in verse number 8, as we look at the main text for this morning. Well, the Bible says, His disciples say unto Him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone Thee, and goest Thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not yet twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. We see here in this story of the raising of Lazarus, the death and the resurrection of Lazarus, we see here an interjection. Jesus understands that Lazarus is sick, and that he has died. The Lord Jesus says that he sleeps. Of course, the disciples thought that that was good for Lazarus to do because that would be restoration of health. It's what sick people need to do. They need rest. But Jesus was speaking of death. And he says, it's time now to go back to Judea. It's time to go back there. And there we're going to go and we're going to visit Lazarus. Of course, his disciples did not know that he was going to raise him from the dead. But the Lord Jesus Christ knew exactly what's to take place. The disciples say unto the Lord, Lord, you've gone to Judea before and there is, a, there is a bounty out for your head. They have tried to kill you and stone you. They've tried to capture you. They've tried to take in you because you've claimed that you are the Son of God. And why in the world are you going back to Judea? And I find it very interesting what Jesus answered in verse number 9. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. 
These things said he, and after he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. The disciples are aware. Now the Lord is going to do something. The answer that he gives to them is an intriguing one to me. It made me pause. It made me stop and think. Is the Lord Jesus simply saying here that if he goes in the daytime, that he's going to be fine? It's in the night that he'll be captured and taken. Is he telling his disciples, if you're going to work, work during the day? You'd think you would work during the cover of night, wouldn't you? If you were trying to go in somewhere and people were trying to get, take your life and hunt you down, you'd think you'd work under the cover of night. But the Lord says here, there are 12 hours in the day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's 12 hours in the day to work, to labor. If a man walks in the light, in the day he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. There's something more to this than daylight and darkness. There's something more to this light and darkness than just 12 hours in the day. The Lord is helping us to understand. I think it's important that we compare Scripture with Scripture and see what the Lord Jesus Christ has already said about Himself. Would you go to John chapter 8 with me? Let's move back just a little bit as we examine the main message. In John chapter 8, in verse number 12, the Lord Jesus spake, and this is what He says. He says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's very interesting, isn't it? The Lord says to his disciples, if you walk in the day, it's, we have to do our work because of the light that shines in this world. There's a power. There's a presence that is going to give us the ability to walk in the day. Look at John chapter 9, this May we remember, has already been said before we arrive to John chapter 11, John chapter 9. And look at verse number 3 with me. Jesus answered and said, Hath this man sinned, or his parents? This is the story of the man that was born blind. People are wondering why this man was blind. His parents must have sinned. And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What he's trying to get his disciples to understand is that now is the time to work. The Lord Jesus is understanding helping them to understand that there are some things that he brings to them that they need in order to live their Christian life. The main message this morning is simply this. In order to live the Christian life, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. If we're going to walk in this world and not stumble and fall over every obstacle and every fear and every trial and every terror, we're going to have to do it in the light of the Lord. We're going to have to do it with the power of God upon us. We're going to have to do it day by day seeking the Lord and walking with the Lord and being filled with His Spirit. He's trying to get His disciples, those that are following Him, the ones that He's called to be with Him. He's trying to get them to understand that is not, that mankind is not an obstacle too big for him. Threats are not an obstacle that's too big for him. Terror is not an obstacle that's too big for him. Death itself is not an obstacle that's too big for God. Amen. And God is very shortly going to prove this. As he walks back in Judea with people who hate him, He's going to walk right in the middle of them all. He's going to command their attention and their respect. And he's going to do a work that is mighty. And in the midst of all those Jews who hate him, he's going to raise a dead man who's been dead already. 
so much so that he stinketh. He's going to raise that man from the dead. And many of those Jews are going to believe. In order for you and I to live the Christian life, we need Jesus. We need the Lord. We need to understand Him. I want to show you one that you're very familiar with in the Word. Thomas. Do you remember Thomas? We call him what? Doubting Thomas? Oh, he has a reputation for a reason. <laughs> This portion of scripture that we're given, the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 11, we're back there and let's look at verse 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. John 11 in verse number 12 says, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe. Do you see the Lord is trying to get them to understand and to believe on him? It's not just good enough to say you're a follower of Christ. It's not good enough just to say that you're a Christian. God wants us to trust in him. He wants us to believe in him, in his ability, in his power, in his able to overcome. Ability to overcome. That you might believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Verse 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, and to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Thomas didn't believe the Lord was going to make it out alive. He didn't believe that Jesus had the ability to overcome the obstacles that were before him. Let's go. Let's go with him. We're going to die too. Might as well die with him. It's a valiant death. We'll be persecuted. Let's die with him. He didn't believe that he could overcome. He didn't believe that he could make it through Judea. He didn't believe that he could make it through what the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to accomplish in his life. He didn't believe. Let's just go and die with him. We know the end of this story. Jesus Christ comes. He raises Lazarus from the dead. God does many wonderful things. People believe. Now the Jews, boy, they really plot together now. As we discover it, 47 and beyond, in this chapter of John 11, that they're going to really seek the head of Christ because he's troubling their people. I want you to know and understand that in order to live this Christian life, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. What do I mean by that? What is the Lord truly teaching the disciples? In the other book that John wrote, I think we get some clues and indicators as to what is being taught to us. Would you look with me in the book of 1 John? It's in the back of your Bible. First, second, third John, then Jude and Revelation. Would you go with me to first John? Let's begin in chapter one and verse number one. I'll show you what I mean, what I believe God is trying to teach us as we say we need Jesus. What do we mean by this? Walking in the day, walking in the light of the day. Darkness is coming. If darkness comes, we will not be able to walk. We will not be able to make it without stumbling. We need the light. How can we advance in this world? How can we advance in darkness? How can we advance in the day? We need the light. Let me show you. We need his fellowship. Look at chapter one, beginning in verse number one. Would you with me, please? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. John says, hey, no doubt about it, we saw Jesus. We saw God robed in flesh. This is the Son of God. We looked upon Him. We saw Him. We touched Him. But we just didn't touch Him like the woman with the, the touch the hem of the garment. Our hands have handled 
of the word of life. We had daily dealings with God and we saw God do wonderful things. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Look at this. That ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This then is the message we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If ye say that ye have not sinned, ye make Him a liar and His word is not in you. What John is telling us here is we need the fellowship, the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to spend time with Him. We need to know Him. We need to commune with Him. We need to speak to Him. We need, just as John saw Him, just as John looked upon Him, just as John was able to discover who Jesus is, you and I, in order to live the Christian life, we must discover and see and experience God in our lives. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We've challenged you to tithe. We've challenged you to seek the Lord. We've challenged you last week to launch out into the deep, to believe God for something. If you're going to live the Christian life, you need to see the Lord working in your life. We must see Him. We must fellowship with Him. Our fellowship is with the Father. John is saying we must have this sweet fellowship. Not only do we need his fellowship, but we need his family. We need his family. Chapter 2, beginning in verse number 8 of the book of 1 John. The Bible says again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. If we're going to live the Christian life, we need the fellowship of the Lord. We also need fellowship with his family, his children. We cannot expect to be in tune with God and fellowship with God if we have ought against our brother. If there is something between me and you, there, can no, there cannot be communion between me and the Father. We read in 1 John 1 and verse number 9 that if we confess our sins, this is written to Christians, by the way, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then He begins dealing with our sins. Sometimes there's ought between brethren. Brothers and sisters, sometimes... There's fighting and arguing between husbands and wives. You cannot live the Christian life and please the Lord and be at aught with one of His children. It cannot happen. It cannot happen. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. But we need the Lord. We must have his fellowship. We, we need his family. We need his family. I'm so thankful for Christian men and women who encourage me, strengthen me, and enable me. It was a blessing. This week I was planning and preparing and saying some things, and a dear brother called me and greatly encouraged me to do what God's given me to do, to move forward. To advance for the cause of Christ. I tell you, there's nothing, there's nothing like great encouragement from God's family. Amen. We assemble together here as Christian brothers and sisters to come together to get encouragement, 
to come together and find out what God's doing in this world and becoming and being a part of what God is doing. We need the fellowship of the family of God. Oh, we need to gather around the Lord and sing praises together and be, be molded and shaped in iron sharpening iron, allowing God's people to mold us and to make us. We need the Lord. We need His fellowship. We need His family. We need His Father. Would you go to 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 13. I want you to see that we need this fellowship with the Father. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us. 1 John 4 and 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, look at this, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God. Jump over to chapter 5 and look with me at verse number 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. If we're going to live the Christian life, we need Jesus. We need His fellowship. We need His family. And we need His Father. We must worship God. We must find, we must find a place to worship the Lord. Where is that place? Where do we worship God? We worship God in spirit. We worship God in truth. The Lord seeks such to worship, and the Father seeks. They that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. This is so important. We understand this. Spirit and truth. Spirit is speaking of the inner man, the place where God dwells. God lives in us. We, we've seen this. It's through His Son. It's through the Holy Spirit of God that God lives in us. We have God in us. God is there. If you and I are going to live the Christian life, we must find a place of worship that is in our spirit. In our spirit. We do not worship God in the soul. We worship God in spirit. Amen. The soul is intellect, emotion, and will. God is looking for us to worship Him in spirit. If all the farther God gets into us is in our soul, we are dead. We are dead. We're dead. We, when, we con when we bring people to God by concentrating on man and trying to, trying to make God appeal to mankind... We do not bring God, we cannot get God in far enough into man. A man is a triunity, a three part being body, soul, and spirit. Body is aware of the world, it's ears, eyes, nose, sight, right? All of those things. If we just try to present God and try to get him in through the senses, we're, we're, we're going to fall short. That was very interesting. The Spirit of God is playing the piano today. Uh, I must have struck a chord. But I won't. Yes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. When we, when we discover truths about God, we intellectually understand these things. But it is more than head knowledge. It is heart knowledge. My wife was dealing with a lady and had been dealing with her for some time, giving her the gospel. One day, my wife was at home, and this lady called, and she was in a fury. She was just all in a tizzy, all worked up inside. 
And she just started jumping right into conversation with my wife on the phone. And she said, I, I want to believe. I want the thing that makes you different. And I want the thing that makes your family different. And I want what Christians have. But she said, I just cannot intellectually believe that Jesus rose from the grave. That's just impossible. I cannot believe that. She had all the head knowledge, but she, could, she did not have the heart knowledge. You see, if we try to bring God and appeal to man intellectually with God, there is going to come a place where all of that ends. And faith must pick up there in order to get God in someone. That is spiritual worship. Intellect has to be put down because all intellect does, it puffeth up. You cannot come to God in pride. You have to come to him abased. We, if we're going to live the Christian life, we cannot do it by outward power, by trying to get some outward power, peer pressure, uh, rules and regulations. It will not come that way. We have to find spiritual worship. We have to worship God in the spirit, not with a head, not with a will, not with emotion. It must come from the spirit, God moving in us and working out of us. When I was a, ch when I was a child, my family used to sing a song years ago, back in the 80s. From the inside out, God's working in me. From the inside out. We so often try to work from the outside in with people. God is looking to work from the inside out. You understand this? If we're going to live the Christian life, we need the Lord. We, understand, we need to understand that the Father is in us, and He is looking to be communed with. He's looking to be worshipped with. This is the main message. Let's look at the maintenance required, may we? Would you turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4? We'll read this portion of Scripture. I won't belabor it. I've already done it. 2 Corinthians. 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Don't ask me what comes before 1 Corinthians. I know what comes before 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. Would you look there with me, please? Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the, that the excellency of the power of Maybe of God and not of us. How are we going to live the Christian life? Where's the power coming from? It's coming from God. But where is God? He's in us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Why not? That's a lot of things to deal with. Troubled, distressed, perplexed, persecuted, cast down. That's a lot of things to deal with. But we're going to be okay, Paul says. How come? How is this possible? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life 
also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, look at this, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment, working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. How are you not perplexed? How are you not distressed? How are you not in despair? How are you not destroyed? The inward man is renewed day by day. This is the maintenance. The maintenance that's required to live the Christian life. If you and I are going to live the Christian life, we need Jesus. We need the Lord. We need to know Him. We must fellowship with Him. We must be encouraged by God's people. We must worship God. We need the Lord. Dear friend, are you troubled? Are you fearful? Are you terrified? Are you cast down? Are you overcome as sin and fear and trial and terror overcome you? In order to live the Christian life, you need Jesus. You need to know that He lives in you and that He's desiring for you to fellowship with Him. And He's desiring for you to be encouraged by other Christians. He's wanting to do something in your life. Where's the power going to come from? Where's the power going to come from to overcome? It's going to come through our worship of the Lord. Our worship of the Lord. Let's come to Jesus. Let's find Him. Let's discover Him. The disciples. Lord, we're going to go there. And we're going to die. And they're going to kill you. Guys, let's just go. Let's go. Let's do it. We'll fight valiantly. We'll die a martyr's death. But God has so much for us, so much more for us than just to lay down and play dead. We are overcomers because God lives in us. He lives in us. Let's allow Him to fill us with His power so that we can be in the same position as Paul, not distressed, not in despair, not forsaken, not destroyed. Let's stand to our feet together. May we every head bowed and every eye closed. Sin has got a firm hold on you. There's some here today struggling to overcome. Struggling. If you know Christ, the answer is within. God lives in you. The answer is within. It's going to come through worship. Worship of your spirit. Through worship. You need to get along with God. I'm just trying to be frank with you. You need to get along with God and tell the truth about yourself to God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Tell the truth to God. He already knows it. He's told us we're sinners. We know our place. You must come there and then tell truths to God about Himself. Worship Him. It will be a reviving thing. That, so, that spirit that spirit will be stirred. It will be energized. It will be revived. And you'll move forward 
with strength to overcome. It does not come by being busy. It comes by being still and worshiping God. Dear Christian friend, we invite you to come and pray. You need the Lord. You need His fellowship. You need to worship Him. Come. Come. Don't play dead to God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we invite you to come. If Christ does not live in you, there is no power to overcome. You cannot overcome sin. You cannot overcome trouble, fear, anxiety, worry, none of it, none of it, none of it. You cannot be what God desires for you to be without Him. He has not designed it that way. He will not allow you to be successful without Him. Come to Him. If you don't know Christ as Savior, we invite you to come. Men and women are here. They'll meet you. They'll take you to a private room and show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Dear friend, if you've not followed Christ in baptism, I want to encourage you to come. Be obedient to the Lord in this matter. Be obedient to Him. If you believe it's God's will for you to be a part of this local assembly, to join us, help us carry out the Great Commission, come, let us know of your desire to do so. Let God work in your life in this way, through this church. We invite you to come. We won't belabor. We invite you to come. Come quickly. No peace, no joy, no purpose. What's the point of all this? If you're struggling with those thoughts in your mind and in your heart, I want you to know I've been there. And I know the reason why I was there. because there was no fellowship with God. No fellowship with Him. No worship. No worship. Everything was external. My own power, my own might, my own abilities, my own reasoning. And there is something invigorating about coming to the Lord, finding His help. If you want peace and power, purpose rest you'll find it all in him all of it's there I appreciate your attention I'm going to ask Brother Jacob to come he's going to give us maybe just some closing announcements some reminders he'll pray for us and we'll be dismissed just a reminder to all those who have uh, children that they're going to be picking up uh, those classes have advanced now and so uh, follow the instructions on the paper that you were given, and that will show you where to pick up your children. Let's pray.